Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. My guest today is a Harlem kid who made good, very good, in a life illuminated by enormous talent and clouded by a penchant for self-destruction. I'm colored, Jewish, and Puerto Rican. When I move into a neighborhood, I wipe it out. Mr. Bojangles. Sammy Davis Jr., singer, actor, dancer, impressionist, the target both of white bigotry and rejection by the black community. Sammy is very much present with us today because of a brilliant new documentary called Sammy Davis Jr., I've Gotta Be Me. Emmy and Peabody Award winner Sam Pollard directed the film. You will meet him and through him, a Sammy Davis Jr. you did not know. Next. What a pleasure it is to welcome Sam Pollard to the program. Uh, edited five or six uh, Spike Lee films, produced episodes of Eyes on the Prize, a documentary on August Wilson, so much more. Um, welcome. Thank you for having me, Tony. How did this come about, Sam? Where did this begin for you to direct this film? Uh, initially, I was approached by the executive producer of the PBS series American Masters, Michael Cantor, who had been developing this project for a few mm -hmm. years, had raised a considerable amount of money from the National Endowment of Humanities, and had brought in a writer named Lawrence Maslin, who's a colleague of mine at NYU. And as they started to put all the pieces together, they were looking for someone to direct it. And I had just finished directing The Ground on Which I Stand, the documentary about August Wilson, and I knew Michael. So he pro approached me and asked me if I was up for directing this doc on Sammy. Now, I didn't have to think about it too long because I grew up watching Sammy on the Ed Sullivan Show in Hollywood Palace, listening to him, listening to him do impressions of Jimmy Stewart, James Cagney, right. Humphrey Bogart, listening, watching him with Sinatra and Dean Martin in Sargent's Three and Ocean's Eleven. So this was in my wheelhouse. Yeah. So I was very excited about doing it. So that was your impression of this guy. You never uh, saw him in person, I take it? I never saw him in person. But, you know, when I was 16 years old, I had read his autobi first autobiography, Yes, I Can, and I was, like, fascinated by him, you know, the struggles he mm -hmm. had as a black man in America, as an entertainer, you know, marrying a white woman, my Brit, and all the brickbats he got from both white people who didn't like the fact that he was integrating in this society right. during that period, and from black people who felt he had forgot where he came from as a black man. Very complicated man, very complicated story. And it, it seems to me, you know, if you look at the title of the documentary, Sammy Davis Jr., I've Gotta Be Me, one of his very famous songs, I think about that, I've Gotta Be Me, there were four or five me's in Sammy Davis Jr. And I wonder if he even knew who he gotta be. I think it was interesting. The thing that's interesting about Sammy is that as he was evolving as both a man, as a black man, as an entertainer, he was struggling with this notion of identity, something that I'm familiar with as an African-American man growing up in America in the 20th century, watching the television screen and seeing people like Humphrey Bogart and Kirk Douglas and Burt Lancaster and not seeing people who look like me most of the time, except for initially Sidney Poitier. So he was struggling with that notion of identity. And think about it this way, too, Tony. He was a performer. He was someone who had been on the stage since the age of three. And he loved, the need, he needed audiences' attention. You know, he wanted to be, you know, engaged by the audience. He wanted, he wanted to be loved, loved like many entertainers. He wanted, many to, be entertainers, he wanted yeah. to be loved. So this is what, you know, he's out there always trying to find out, why should you love me? This is what I can give you so you can love me. He was one of these men who went on stage and he was supposed to do a 40-minute act with his uncle and his dad, Will Maston and right. Sammy Davis Sr. He would do an hour and 20 minutes when he was a solo performer and touring in Europe or touring in Italy, in England or other countries, this guy would give you two hour, two and a half hour shows. You know, one thing your film, uh, which is really wonderful, reminds me, and, and you need to be jogged about this with Sammy Davis Jr. because there are so many different impressions here, but just the raw, enormous talent that he had to do <laughs> everything. I mean, early in the film, you've got him at seven years old 
dancing and tap dancing in a movie, a Hollywood movie. I mean, he's at seven, he owns that stage. He's fantastic. You know, he's one of these, these performers who could see something and just absorb it. You see him imitate Jerry Lewis, and he's Jerry Lewis. You see him perform these impressions of Cagney and Jimmy Stewart and Edward G. Robinson. He's those guys. This was a guy who, when in 1958, 1959, there was a show on TV called Lawman with John Russell right. and Peter Brown. Now, Peter, Gra Peter Brown was considered one of the fastest drawers with a gun ever. Hmm. Sammy picked it up from Peter Brown. You know, <laughs> he picked it up from Peter Brown. He became faster. You know, this was a guy who was a sponge. He sits down at the drums. He, he, he hangs out with Buddy Rich, Gene Krupa, and, he, and Mickey Rooney, who also played drums. And he could play drum as, drums as well as Buddy Rich. He could pick up a bass. He could pick up a trumpet. This guy was a, simply a sponge. He was just such a, you know, a, a smart talent. There's a, there's a Latin word I remember from high school, ingenium. It means natural inbred ability. He had it. And, and he had it. Let's go back to these obstacles that he faced. And, and um, there's a clip from the film that I, that I want to show sure. that helps illustrate this. His gift was his talent. The curse was being black in America. It's no fun to walk into a place you're going to play and be told that we've had 14 bomb threats. Even if you win, you don't win. What did he mean by that? Even if you win, you don't win. He's telling his story at that particular point when he was in the Army. And just think about this. For most of his early life, until he was 18 years old, he was pretty sheltered. You know, he was sheltered by his uncle. He was sheltered by his dad. He was sheltered by all the other performers, black and white, that he met on the road. Here he joins the Army at 18, and all of a sudden, he has to face mm -hmm. overt segregation. This story comes from, this line comes from him telling a story about how he was on the chow line and the white man says, you can't stand in front of me. And Sammy turns and knocks the guy down, breaks the guy's nose. The guy looks up at Sammy and says, you may have beaten me, you may have beaten me, but you're still a oh. And so Sammy realized that his fist were not going to be the way he's going to accomplish things and train and change people's mind, hearts and minds. You know, that's what he meant by that line. Yeah, that wasn't the, from the film, it wasn't, it, we'd learned that wasn't the only humiliation he suffered in the army. I mean, it was, it was. They peed on him, they painted him white. He was, he was constantly humiliated, you know, and it was like a horrific, horrific experience with Sammy. But the thing that's fascinating for me about this man, with all of this stuff that he had, all these things that came down on him, like, you know, like an avalanche, he was always able to find a way to push through, to push through. And he tells a great story. When he comes out of the army and he's back with his uncle and his dad, he's doing these impressions of Cagney and Bogart, and his uncle and his dad are t terrified. How can a young black man have the audacity to want to stand up in front of an audience and do white men, which I didn't even realize that was such a, such a thing that was so hard. Oh, I mean, it's, 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 it's such a... I, I don't know, it just freezes the brain to, to think that that was never done before, a black man, entertainer, uh, 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 doing impressions of white stars. That I wasn't done. I mean, I... <laughs> that was one of those revelations for me. You know, I thought I knew everything about Sammy, but when I heard that story, I was, like you, I was surprised. Let's show another clip because it has those, I think it has the impression, some of the impressions in it. Sure. Sammy was show business from the tip of his toes to the top of his head. If you played it for her, you can play it for me. And Sammy's like, I'm a black guy, but I'm going to imitate a white guy. You dirty rat. <laughs> this was really groundbreaking at the time he did it. Yeah! Paying out with Sinatra and those guys increased his cool factor. He's one of the boys. Yeah. Um... I mean, he could do so much. I, I just want to jump back to something you said. He had been, you know, sort of protected in a cocoon with his uncle and his, his dad, dad uh, uh, in the Will Manson trio. Uh, I mean, so uh, enveloped or, or surrounded, he never went to school. Not one hour did he ever spend in a classroom. None. So... To go in the army or to do anything at age 18 that wasn't on stage and with his father and uncle obviously had to be a real shock to his system. It was a major shock because he had dreams when he went in the army of being in the Air Corps. 
You know, he had seen those movies with Jimmy Cagney and Dennis Morgan. God is my co-pilot. Right. He wanted to be in the Air Corps. He took the test. He could barely get through the test. He couldn't read. Luckily, he met a sergeant when he was in basic training who started to give him books and taught him how to read those books, mm. you know. And the thing that Sammy had that other performers had who didn't have much education, he had a ferociousness to learn. He wanted to learn, so he started to read and read and read and read. And he's just, he sort of became a self-taught man. Now, he never learned how to really spell, as he says in the film. He never learned how to write paragraphs, but he was, he was always trying to figure out how to learn stuff, you know. Mm. And it's amazing because, you know, his mother, his dad, and his, and his uncle took him on the road. And they realized, you know, which is very complicated, they realized that this young man was going to be a breadwinner for them. He became a major breadwinner for these guys because as he got older and you could see how his talent was flourishing, it's clear that he was the center of that group. You know, first it was Sammy Davis Jr. featuring Sammy Davis Jr. starring Sammy Davis Jr. with the Will Master Trio. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I remember those. Talking with Sam Pollard, the director of uh, a new documentary on Sammy Davis Jr. called Sammy Davis Jr., I got, I've got to be me, which premiered recently at the Toronto International Film Festival. It's coming to New York. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But that last clip, uh, part, we see him with the, in the Rat Pack with Sinatra and Dean Martin. And, uh, and you know, the narration, or not narration, the, the, voiceover. the, the voiceover, the, whoever the, you, that interview was saying he was one of the boys. It struck me, and uh, I wanted to ask you, was he one of the boys or was he, I mean, I think there's a, t a title card in the film, Junior Partner. Partner. Well, it depends on what side of the road you're on. Yeah. There are those who we interviewed who said that to say that Sammy was not a full partner, not fully a part of the Rat Pack is horrible to say. There are those who say, you know, that Sinatra treated him like a pet sometimes. They had a, Sinatra and, Sin, and Sammy had a very complicated relationship. As someone says, as David, someone says in the film, if, Sinatra, if Sammy could be anybody, he would have been, you know, a black Frank Sinatra. Black, yeah. He worshipped Frank Sinatra ever since he saw him at the Paramount in the 40s. He mm. worshipped him. He dressed like them. If you, if you remember Sinatra with the big bow ties, right. Sammy wore the big bow ties, you know, and those, that type of zoot suits they had in those days. He tried to sing like Sinatra. He wanted to smoke like Sinatra, dress like Sinatra, drink like Sinatra. And when Sinatra took him under his wing, and basically, you know, Sinatra was a man who was so complicated himself, he could love Sammy one moment, and then him and Sammy would not be talking for another moment. There's a story, which is not in this film, that in 1958, when Sinatra was getting ready to produce this film, Never So Few, a war picture with, that ended up having Steve McQueen in it, that role was originally for Sammy Davis Jr. Mm, but, but Sammy had been on the radio show and said some denigrating things about Sinatra. Sinatra oh. banded him <laughs> from the movie. Well, I guess I'm asking probably in coded language, or just come right out and ask whether you formed an opinion. Um, uh, you know, was Sammy their token or was he really one of the rap? I think it's complicated. I think that on some level, at a certain point when they were doing those performances on the stages of Vegas, Sammy started to feel uncomfortable. You know, as the, as the 60s were evolving and things were happening in the civil rights movement and Sammy started to connect with Dr. King, I, I think he started to feel uncomfortable. I think earlier he wasn't thinking about it and, you know, and people were just enjoying them on the stage. But I think if you, if you look at some of that later stuff, there's a great moment. Dean Martin would pick up Sam. Yeah, and, he's, and he yeah. says, I'd like to thank the NAACP for this wonderful trophy. The first few times they did in the old days, Sammy never said anything. Near the end of that sort of thing between the Rat Pack, Sammy said, put me down, right. which is a, a code for Sammy not feeling very comfortable yeah. with it, you know? So I think it's a complicated thing, yeah. you know? Well, I'll talk about complication and... and, and Las Vegas in those days, he could perform with the Rat Pack, but he couldn't stay in the hotels. Yeah, to I mean, go into the you, black It's side. okay you, if you can, you know, if you're African American, you could be on the stage, but you can't be in any of the rooms. You uh, couldn't walk through the front door. You couldn't. You couldn't swim in the pool. 
Well, there's a, is it in your film? Yeah, it's in the film. Yeah. The, uh, they drain uh, the pool. At the Sands Hotel, he apparently swam in the pool and, and they drained it. Drained the pool. But that's a story that's apocryphal that's been told about Harry Belafonte and Dorothy oh, okay. Dandridge. But it's the, it's the you know, there's well, a it's truth not, to it. Yeah, it's not apocryphal that you know people like Sammy couldn't, you know, if, if they were going to be in Vegas performing, they had to stay. On the black side of town. Yeah. They stayed in the black side of town. They all did. No. You know, so it was, you know, you think about it. I think about it as a, as a man now in my 60s, looking back on that period. And I grew up in New York City, so I never really interacted with that kind of stuff. My dad did, who was from Mississippi. My mom did, who was from Georgia. But to see it and to realize, man, what a, what a country we had in the 20th century, you know, doing our, you know, years of Jim Crow. Well... I, you know, I don't want to get off into a sidetrack, but there's a lot of people who would say it's still what a country and the, I know. the stuff that goes on. I but know. That's another story. Another show. Um, the Rat Pack, cool as it was, and, you know, Ocean's Eleven and the whole thing, but it wasn't long, you know, probably 64, maybe 65. That wasn't cool It wasn't anymore. cool anymore. And, I mean, that was... They were passe to a lot of people, maybe the, yeah. the you know, diehard Sinatra and Vegas people, but that wasn't, that wasn't anybody's idea of cool anymore. Well, the world was changing. And here we have, we have the Voting Rights Act happening. You, you know, the March on Washington happened a few years before. You know, it, would, it wouldn't be soon before there were riots in the cities, you know, in L.A. and New York, you know, and Detroit was coming up. I mean... This was, a, this was a very tumultuous time. We had Vietnam. So these, these four guys, Dean Martin, Sinatra, Sammy, Joey Bishop, and sometimes Peter Lawford, you know, having fun on the stage didn't seem like so much fun to a lot of Americans. Yeah. You know. Uh, before we get to Sammy's participation in, in, in the civil rights and his embrace of uh, Martin Luther King, uh, we could jump back to 1960, and he marries a white woman. My Brit. My Brett, a gorgeous, stunning actress. I mean, but be, but before that, and I'm not sure how long before he had dated Kim Novak, who was also a, a Hollywood icon and another gorgeous. And it was I was surprised to learn, and kind of took my breath away, that Harry. there was a contra. It was almost like when that when the studio head found out about that he did almost put a contract on Sammy's life. I mean... Well, Harry Cohen was not happy with one of his major stars at that time. Kim Novak. Kim Novak, you know, hanging out with Sinatra. Now, I mean, hanging out with Sammy. Now, now, just to be clear, Kim Novak always says till this day that they were just friends. Yeah. That's her okay. line, that they were just friends. And Harry Cohen, as we all know from those of us who are movie aficionados like I am, He's a very powerful man, and he knew some very powerful people and some very not-so-nice people. So they made Sammy, as, as Mr. Brando said in The Godfather, an offer he couldn't refuse, you know. And Sammy went out, and he married a black woman. I mean, is the story literally true, or is how much of this is apocryphal, that he was told, marry a black woman in 48 hours or you're dead? I think, you know, everybody... It's been, it's been exaggerated. Everybody spends it. I was with a woman in Toronto last week who walked up to me after the Sammy Davis screening and said she knew LaRae White, who had married sure. Sammy's first wife. And she says, LaRae White said to her that some mobs just came to her when she was on the dance line at this club, pulled her off the line and said, you got to marry Sammy Davis Jr. So <laughs> it's probably many variations on this story. It's a, whatever it is, it's a, <laughs> it's a great story. It's a great story and a... Chilling story. <laughs> All right, here's a guy, you know, the complications, the different characters struggling with identity. Here's a guy who in the 60s, middle 60s, 63, was part of the March on Washington, Sammy Davis Jr., yeah. and embraces Martin Luther King. And six, uh, eight, nine years later, he's embracing Richard Nixon and, uh, and reviled for it. Uh, mm -hmm. By many. Because, think of it this way, Tony, here's a man who, as we have said earlier, is always looking for adulation. 
looking for people to love him, people to, to embrace him, mm -hmm. people to say, you are great. We want you to be with us. So, you know, he wasn't, you know, like Harry Belafonte, someone who was ready to jump into the movement. They had to pull him into the movement. You know, when he was in Golden Boy and, and, and Harry asked him to go down to Selma, Sammy said no. He didn't want to go south. He was afraid. It took Harry Belafonte buying out the theater, you know, when they was, Golden Boy was performing to persuade Sammy, to force Sammy not, to go down. Nothing wrong with being afraid to go to Selma. No, 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 nothing wrong. But Sammy wasn't like Harry, no. wasn't like Ruby D or Ossie Davis. He had to be cajoled to go down there. And then, you know, and he's, and like someone says in the film, he gave a lot of money to the movement. Mm -hmm. But if we fast forward to 72, remember when Kennedy was elected president and they had his big gala, Sammy was disinvited. By Frank Sinatra. By, by, by Kennedy, but Sinatra. By, by, yeah. But that, Sinatra gave him the word. Yeah. And that had to be a horrific blow to Sammy, that here he is with Sinatra and the others supporting JFK running for the presidency of the United States. He gets elected, and then, because he's married to my Brit, he can't go to the, the gala. So and, perf and perform and be and part of it. And perform and be part yeah. of it. And you see Harry Belafonte and Cindy Poitier and Ella Fitzgerald, you know. And then you fast forward, and so all of a sudden, when Nixon's White House reaches out to him and say, we embrace you, come sleep in the Lincoln bedroom, Sammy jumps at it. Because think of it this way, as he says, here I am, here I am as a little black kid growing up in Harlem. Now I'm sleeping in the Lincoln bedroom in the White House. He wouldn't, he couldn't say no. You of course. Because yeah. that's his need. That's the need he constantly had. Extraordinary need. And you find it in so many performers. They, they're, they're alive and, and uh, what's the word I want? They are completely comfortable in themselves in front of lights. That's right. And take them off the stage, and they're, many of them are... Insecure. 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 It's, uh, I yeah. mean, it's, it, it's not exclusive to Sammy Davis Jr. It may have been exaggerated with him, or he exaggerated. Well, it's like when he hugged Nixon. As David Steinberg says in the film, Sammy hugged everybody. It wasn't like it was a calculated move on Sammy's part. He hugged everybody. The problem with that hug was that photos were taken and it was put across the news. And so the people in the black community were like, what? So when he goes to Chicago in Operation Push and he's getting ready to perform, that's why they boo Sammy. But he had to constantly deal with the black community and the black press saying, Sammy, have you forgot where you're from? And that's not unusual for some black performers to have to go through that you know, as they become more and more successful and make more and more money. You know, I mean, people will always ask, well, how come Michael Jordan is not active in, the, you know, in, in dealing with the violence in America? No, he doesn't want to do it. But he catches those brick bats too. Harry, even at his ages of 80 and 85, he was challenging people like Jay-Z. Yeah. How come you're not being more active? Right. You know? it, uh, the film... Uh, that Sam directed, which I saw the other day, is just brilliant. And I want to tell you about a scene that is so poignant, uh, it almost made me cry. And I should say that film starts, or early in the film, you see Sammy da dancing as a seven-year-old, uh, you know, in a movie. Rufus Jones, the president. Toward the end of the movie, um, he is sitting in a box being honored by the NAACP and the box is very close to a stage and there's a you know, whole bunch of people performing and honoring Sammy Davis Jr. One of them, Gregory Hines, walks over to Sammy and hands him a box and in the box is a pair of tap shoes. Now at this point, Sammy Davis Jr. is 64 years old and he's dying of throat cancer. In fact, he would die about three months after this scene. And Sammy puts on the shoes and walks onto the stage. And what happens after that is sublime. Sublime. I, I won't try to describe it. It's just yeah. sublime. You have to see this film. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's one of those wonderful moments. It's extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to tell the audience a little bit about it coming to New York, but I, I gotta, I, I can't let you go without asking you, what's it like to work with Spike Lee? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
That's the usual question. I yeah. always get. I'm sure you've answered that question a million times. Well, you know, the, I, I have to say this, and, I, and I've said this publicly before. Spike is one of the great filmmakers, in my opinion. Oh. One of the great filmmakers. Sure. And uh, it was, uh, it's always been a challenge. He always makes you rise to another level as an editor. You know, when he brings the material into the room, he's tough. He reminds me of the old Hollywood directors, the John Fords and the Howard Hawks, because you know that he's a leader. Mm. He's, he's never indecisive. He knows what he likes. He knows what he doesn't like, you know, and he can articulate it. We never have lots of conversations about, you know, try this or try that. He knows, you know, he knows what he likes. I mean, you, it sounds like what you're describing is two of you in an edit room. It's not about a conversation. Well, I think this worked. No, what about, can we try? It's about, Sam, do this, do that. I want yeah, this I mean, in there. I want sometimes to... we'll conversate, but he's... I mean, not to say he might not listen to your suggestion. But he's strong. He's a very strong director. I probably the the strongest director I've ever worked with, you know. And for me, the, the wonderful thing about working with him on his films is that he never takes the easy route, easy route. You know, he's always trying something different, which forces me as an editor to try something different. Mm. You know, so from Mo' Better Blues to Clockers to Bamboozle, it was always something in those films that made me say, wow, I got to raise the level of my game, mm. you know. And well, you've raised the level of your game many times, and not least with this, with this film, this documentary. Sammy Davis Jr., I've Gotta Be Me. It's going to have its New York City premiere at the Doc NYC Festival, DOC short for documentary. Doc NYC Festival, which is the country's largest documentary film festival, and it, uh, it starts here in the city, that festival does, in about two weeks. Uh, on November 9th, and I guess if you check the Doc NYC website, you can find out where, where, what theater you'll be able to see Sam's film. Uh, what do you come away with this, from it with? From the Sammy Davis film? Yeah. That to be a celebrity, a black African-American celebrity, it can be a very tough road, you know? Yeah. You, can, you, can, you can make money, you can be successful, but there's always the downside, there's always the struggles that even with all that success, you're still a human being who's conflicted, who's anguished, who's concerned about how people see you, how you want to be seen. And, you, and to me, it's, it makes him just a fascinating human being. I like to make films about human beings who are complicated. And that's what I come away with, dealing with a man who's very complicated. Well, your passion for what you do is uh, infectious, and it uh, almost makes me want to sign up for one of your classes at NYU. <laughs> um, so if I happen to walk in the door one day, don't throw me out. You're welcome. All right. <laughs> Sam Pollard, it's great to have you. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you so much. Be good. We will see you next time.